Oh Lord, may the words of our mouth, the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Wendell Berry is one of my favorite poets. And um, Google him one of these days and I think you'll like him too. He's a farmer, but he's a great theologian as well. He wrote this from um, 1999. It's a poem he wrote called Sabbath. The subtitle, Again I Resume the Long Season. Again, I resume the long lesson. How small a thing can be pleasing. How little in this hard world it takes to satisfy the mind and bring it to its rest. From these lines that I love, these are like Lenten lines, so let them sink in during this season. Resume the, less, the long lesson of small things. The simple lessons, usually the most powerful lessons in Lent are the most simple ones, but they're also the hardest to learn and take the longest to learn. The lessons of forgiveness and love, of hope, the lessons of loving your neighbor as you love yourself. But maybe that's the point. The lessons we learn from Lent, maybe they should take all of our lives to learn. For we are all under construction from birth till death. And Lent says that. So what is a small thing? Well, we just witnessed it when our readers read our call to worship. The small thing was Jesus saying no in the wilderness. Jesus encounters uh, Satan in the wilderness all alone. And Satan is a great salesman. That's one reason I could never be a good salesman. It's because Satan made Jesus say no three times before he gave up, right? Isn't that the key? I'd be like, hey, you want to buy something? No. Okay, no problem. I, you know, I would starve if I had to sell something. Um, but Satan is good at that. Like Moses listening for the Spirit and seeking a new land, Jesus walked through the wilderness listening and seeking. Jesus' ministry was ahead of him. He hadn't recruited the first disciple yet, and he hadn't started making his trip to Jerusalem. And there's a lot of echoes. Uh, Moses spent his time in the wilderness. He spent 40 years. And I feel a lot more like Moses than I do Jesus. Because Jesus spent his time, uh, Moses spent his time with a whole bunch of people. He was the chief storyteller, you know. The wagons would stop at night. He'd tell them to, you know, he'd try to rev them up to get closer to the promised land. But Jesus went to the wilderness alone, not with a group of people. He went right after his baptism when God, a voice from heaven, said, this is my son in whom I, whom I am pleased, well pleased. And so he goes into the wilderness. It's not an accident. He's led by the Spirit. And for 40 days, he didn't eat anything. And Jesus was hungry. I would be hungry after... I'm hungry after four hours if I don't eat anything. I couldn't last 40 days. But it wasn't just food that Jesus was hungry for. He was lonely. And he was alone. And Jesus was there. Um, and you know, a lot of us are very seldom um, alone. Now, we may feel lonely, but we're all surrounded by a whole lot of people all the time, kind of like Moses. Um, and sometimes you can get so surrounded by people that you get so busy, and it's, it's about bills and getting kids where they need to get and doing all the things you need to do, that all of a sudden you can lose your identity of who you are. But I think it can also happen when you're alone. Because who among us if I asked you to describe yourself, wouldn't start talking about the very people who've shaped you, your family, your friends, the people you work with. So there Jesus is, 40 days and 40 nights. And Satan gives him the big if, the big if. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Aren't you hungry, Jesus? If you are the Son of God, do something spectacular, so that when you get caught by God on your way down, jump, dropping off the building, 
that people would be impressed. Who wouldn't want to follow you then? Be powerful. Get some political power, Jesus. Rule the world, Jesus. And Jesus says, no, no, and no. Sometimes... Sometimes what you say no to defines you. That's what defines you every much is what says yes to you. I've been told there's a yes in every no that you say and there's a no that for every yes that you say. Those of us who are married, remember, saying yes to the one you love is saying no to all kinds of other things. Forsaking all others. Okay, we've got laughter over here. You made that promise, didn't you, Dave? <laughs> it does, doesn't it? <laughs> it is. I mean, we say no, we're defined by it. If you are the Son of God, and you know what? None of us are magicians. I hadn't seen any of you, and I know I hadn't done it. I've never turned a stone into bread. I've never gotten caught, done something spectacular, jumping off a building, and I have never, ever... Um, I'll never have any political power, uh, that's for sure. Um, but I know what it means to be tempted by power, prestige, and possessions. And though I don't have any magical powers, I know that that happens to me every single day. Every day I've got to say no. Karl Barth, great, brilliant theologian from Germany who toured the United States of America, and he was in Chicago, Dr. Bart, do you really believe that the serpent talked to Adam and Eve? Do you really believe that? Yes, I do. How in the world and why do you believe that? Dr. Bart said, because I hear the serpent talk to me every day. Say no. I renounce the forces of wickedness. The problem with me is that the devil has never showed up to me in red spandex and a pitchfork to tempt, right? Temptation and saying no often means saying no to things that appear okay and fine and may, may be fine for everybody else, but it's not the thing for you to say yes to. And you're defined by what you say no to. Jesus said no, and that defined Him. And He's calling us to say, you don't have to have power and you don't have to be prestigious. And you don't have to have all the possessions in the world to be my child. You are my child. Jesus said, what good would it do you if you had everything in the world and lost your own soul? What would it mean? Nothing. Jesus is calling us, with His help, to learn how to say no, like my granddad said sometimes. Because when you say no to some things, you can be a better yes to other things. The things you were meant to be a yes to. And that's what forms you and makes you. But I know it's not easy. Just yesterday, Jen, Susanna, and I traveled to watch Trip play tennis. I'm not going to name the community college because I don't want to disparage anybody. But he plays for Colleen. I can name that one for sure. And all of our community colleges are great. Coach Bizot, I don't know if you know him, but he's, he comes to our early service. And he's the head, head basketball coach at Colin. Tripp's having a great time. And I think we have the best community college system in the nation, I think. That's one of the things we're number one at. We, we can definitely be proud of that. But we went to this certain community college. And the parents looked at me and said, Bruce, get ready. I said, what are you talking about? Get ready. This team is... This coach... They're going to say some things that are going to make you want to punch somebody. I mean, that's what he said. Come on. I was like, I'm laid back. I see the best in people. This is not going to be that big of a deal. But it didn't take me long. <laughs> it didn't take Jen long either. <laughs> Folding chairs by the court. Two wonderful international players on Colin's team. They're both from Columbia. Learn the language, foreigner. I was like, he speaks two languages. How many do you, how many do you speak? Trips playing, no big deal. And uh, all of a sudden, 
uh, I don't know who they were. Let's just call them. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to call them. But there were four or five people right in the middle of the set. Whenever Trip missed the first serve, <coughs> choke, <coughs> choke, choker, choker, <coughs> choke. Hits one out. Maybe you should try to play tennis right-handed, huh? I mean, that's not tennis, y'all. You know that. I mean, you know that's not the way you play tennis. That's not. That's not. That's not real tennis. I mean, you know this as well as I do. Somebody picks on you, that's all right. But if they're picking on your child, game over, right? <laughs> I didn't want to talk to 17, 18 year olds, and I knew better than to do that. But I got in the assistant coach's face and I said, you need to get control of these kids. This is not what this is all about. And he bowed up to me and we bowed up a little bit and then I got backed up a little bit because I didn't want to, <laughs> it's whatever. I thought I probably could have taken, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and there's Tripp battling. It's not, it's not, it wasn't your best game, you know, battling through. You like, you, you know, you, some, it's just like golf or any sport or just like any business. You know, you, you do the best of what you got that day. And Tripp was battling, battling, battling. And they were continually ridiculing him on the side, laughing at him. Some guy on the other court started critiquing his calls. One was, uh, he called it out, you're cheating. You're cheating over there, said. And Tripp is playing and playing and playing. Trying not to say anything. Our coach said, don't you act, don't you act like that. And Tripp is chasing down a volley as fast as he can and finally makes a beautiful volley and he gets face to face with those ridiculers on the side of the fence. And I was thinking, here's your chance. Because <laughs> they didn't have rackets, yeah. right? <laughs> and Tripp did what I think Wendell Berry would call the large lessons of the small things in life. He smiled and he joked. And he said, give me a little bit of credit. Wasn't that a good shot? <laughs> and you know what? They kind of got disarmed, didn't they? They had a hard time ridiculing you after that. Some people think I never... Well, look, I, and, and, and there's a... Uh, and so, but it was bad. It was really bad. You know, uh, we got Jen out of the Stone, uh, Stone County Jail just last night. <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even want to tell you what she did. Um, no, she was great. She was great. But as we were putting those kids on the van, we were like, we're so proud of you, you know. And, and Trip, if you don't win a game. You're a winner. Reminds me of a time at Duty Noble Field when we were playing Ole Miss in baseball and we were all out in the left field lounge and there's a little bit of imbibing going on <laughs> in the left field lounge if you don't know that right fielder for Ole Miss Bulldog hits it back down the foul line the right fielder going back to the wall he jumps up and he catches it right on the wall and then somebody in the left field lounge put about 20 ounces of beer right in his face. And you know what he said? Next time, warn me so my mouth can be open. <laughs> it was hard making fun of him after that. Now, I didn't do that. I would never do that. Um, if you are a Christian, if you're a son of God, if you're a daughter of God, if you are, no, you are a child of God and you've got nothing to prove. Not a thing. You are a child of God. Just trust it. And say no when you got to say no. Because that defines you as much as the things you say yes to. Let's pray.
God, we know we don't need to prove it. We don't need to be powerful, prestigious. We don't have to have it all. And even when people tempt us away from our game and our identity, lead us back in the wilderness and remind us what Jesus did and what He does for all of us. Amen.